Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Frank, and thanks for the invitation to uh, uh, share this information today. So, let's see. I just, uh, it's a little difficult to not be able to, to meet in person. I'll tell you where I am talking to you from. So, Dayton is in the southwest corner of Ohio, and we're pretty much, we're, we're kind of the furthest east uh, that you can be and still be considered part of the American Midwest. Dayton is famous for a few things. Uh, probably the the proudest accomplishment that's occurred in uh, in the city is the uh, invention of powered flight by the Wright brothers. And uh, there's all kinds of historical sites. If you come, if you ever come and visit Dayton, there are many places where you can learn about the evolution of aviation and see it from its very beginning to the, the most state-of-the-art uh, aircraft. So if that's something you're into, you can consider Dayton as a destination once it's safe to travel. The University of Dayton is uh, an old campus uh, built in like the 1850s. And this is, uh, there's kind of two views that you can see. One is from my building, uh, kind of looking to the northeast, and the other is from my building looking uh, to the, uh, the southwest. So I am actually in the very corner of the building over here, and so when I look out my window, that's what I see. The trees are, are just starting to change color, and uh, it's a, a pretty nice sunny day, similar to the one that's, uh, that's in the photo here. So hello from Dayton, Ohio. You're always welcome to come and visit. Just let me know if you're ever uh, nearby. So like Frank said, we're talking about materials that are at the, uh, at the extreme in terms of thickness. We're talking about materials that are one to five molecular layers thick. That's what uh, separates a 2D material from a bulk material. And uh, when you make materials that thin, they demonstrate different properties than they would if they were in bulk form. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. You know, it's just because the, uh, the number of nuclei and electrons, when it's that small, and you are a nuclei or electron, that difference changes the way that you behave. And so optical electronic properties, mechanical properties, they all change once uh, these materials become super thin. So we'll talk about some of those fundamental properties. That part, some of the slides are gonna look complicated. There's gonna be all these energy level diagrams and uh, you've got energy on one axis and crystal momentum on the other. Who even really knows what that is? Don't, don't worry, I think we'll be able to explain it in a way that uh, is easy to apply and understand. So we'll talk about the properties of materials, what happens when materials become super thin. We're gonna talk about how to make them. And uh, I'm lucky I was involved in making 2D materials before it was cool. And so this was a, a field that was a really natural fit and I'm happy to be part of the, the 2D community where there's lots of innovation pioneering work going on in terms of processing and also characterization. Looking at materials that are a few monolayers thick sounds like a challenge. We joke sometimes that we make the emperor's new material, right? And only, you can only see it if you're super smart, but it's really there, we promise. It's super thin. Materials, again, are, are oftentimes almost always less than three nanometers thick. And then at the end, we'll talk about some things you can do with these materials, especially some things that I like to do with them. So if you take a, a layered material, so this is a, a piece of mica, and it's really easy to tear a sheet off of this material. And uh, when you do that, you notice some big differences. The big chunk of mica itself, this thing's like a centimeter thick, and you can't see through it, and it's really rigid. But when you peel a layer off, and the reason you can peel a layer off is because each layer is made of these strong, covalently bound collections of atoms. But they're separated by these weakly bound, you know, just Van der Waals forces holding these individual layers together. So you can tear a layer off and it remains intact. It's pretty strong. But when it's thin, it's way different. It's super flexible. It's optically transparent. It just gives us an idea of, you know, how do things start to change once they become super thin? And so the reason that I think that 2D materials are interesting is they demonstrate all these properties. And here's just a few of the different properties that you can observe. So not only are they flexible, but they're super strong. If I just take this sheet of covalently bound material, I can apply a lot of force before it will rupture. 
And so two D materials are really strong, and it's definitely not going to break in this direction. It's going to be even stronger in that direction. So in the, in the, they're kind of isotropically strong, and that's uh, something that kind of sets them apart. In addition to the fact that they're they're flexible, and obviously when they're thin, they become really transparent. So like graphene, every layer of graphene, every single atomic layer. Uh, absorbs about three percent of the visible light that's incident upon it. So you can, you know, have pretty. Uh, it's pretty much completely transparent. What becomes really interesting is when you want to use these in devices, the materials have pretty exquisite properties. So graphene, for example, has like ultra high uh, electron mobility or charge mobility. You have really high quantum efficiency. So for every photon in, you can generate a photon out for some of these two-dimensional uh, transition metal like calcogenides, especially. But so all those things are pretty interesting. But to me, I think one of the from a fundamental material science standpoint, one of the aspects of 2D materials that's most interesting is that you can take individual layers and stack them up on top of each other to tailor materials at the, the ultimate scaling limit. So you can take, and again, you know, synthetic heterostructures are, are not something new. People have been synthesizing these materials for, for decades, probably about five decades. And, uh, and observing really cool phenomena when you make these super atoms, right? You take individual atomic layers and stack them up and you can get really unique optical and electronic properties. But what has always been a little bit of a barrier for development of new technology in terms of using heterostructures is you're confined to using materials that have a lattice parameter mismatch of less than 2%. So that is to say, if I stack up two materials, they have to have about the same atomic spacing to within 2%. So that really limits what you can, what you can stack up. So if you want to make a bunch of atomic layers in a particular order to achieve a particular purpose, and it's pretty easy to do simulations, you can uh, probably within a week learn how to do simulations of individual atomic layers and model the optical and electronic properties from these uh, stacks of layers. You can, you can input whatever layers you want if they're all these 2D materials that are held together with these van der Waals bonds that are easy to tear apart like that mica because they accommodate all that stress, right, from the interface mismatch, from the different lattice spacings. They accommodate all that stress very easily uh, at their surface. So this is a, a really unique tool. And uh, I think, like Frank said, I think there's a, a lot of applications for these flexible electronic materials. and they're semiconducting, insulating, and uh, conductive 2D materials. You can build entire devices from 2D materials. So every aspect of the material will exhibit these properties of strength, flexibility, and transparency. So we're gonna focus on two types of 2D materials today. These are the, the most well understood of all 2D materials. So we have graphene, which is just individual layers of, of graphite on a surface. And we have transition metal dichalcogenides, which are these kind of atomic sandwiches where you've got some kind of transition metal. Molybdenum is a common one, tungsten is another. And then you have some calcogens attached. Uh, sulfur and selenium are the most common uh, calcogen atoms. And so these atomic sandwiches, they're arranged like this, where the black atoms are the calcogens and yellow atoms are the metals. They're made in these sandwiches, and you can stack these up and uh, induce different properties. We'll see a broad range of band gaps in these transition metals like calcogenides, whereas graphene is best uh, as a conductive material. It doesn't have a large band gap. There are other families of 2D materials. So one of the, you know, again, there's many, many thousands and thousands of papers on graphene and transition metal like calcogenides. Uh, maxines are less uh, well developed but really interesting. These are generally conductive materials and uh, are useful for, for batteries and other applications. We'll, we'll mention them in passing, but we won't talk too much about those in, in the webinar today. So you can see this timeline of interesting nanomaterials that are based on carbon. And it's about every decade, there's a innovation in using these carbon, atomic carbon layers to do something cool. So the first iteration of 
graphite-based or carbon-based nanomaterials for buckyballs, right? So in the early 80s, we see these papers that come from uh, taking a shape, right, of the hexagonal carbon lattice. So these atoms are selected so that when you put them together, they form a sphere like a soccer ball. And these had, you know, interesting properties chemically, mechanically, and uh, this understanding of what happens when you have this collection of carbon atoms evolved to extend to nanotubes, right, which are just a, a, a tube of a single graphene layer. And then uh, about 10 years later, we started to talk about graphene single atomic layers. And it's funny, you know, if you write, if you clean out your grill, or you write with a pencil, chances are you're going to see a few of these structures in the course of your using any of these. Uh, you'll see any of these structures in the course of using an everyday object like a, a pencil or a grill. And uh, the idea of interesting properties from kind of low dimensional forms of carbon is not a new one. So this is a kind of a famous paper from long ago, 1947. And it predicts the, uh, you know, the electronic structure and properties of graphene that give it its really interesting properties. So the idea existed that single layers of carbon would have super cool and really useful properties in terms of transport properties, both in, uh, charge transport, thermal transport, mechanical properties. It was, it was well known, but it took a while for the development of graphene to uh, be something that was uh, something we're aware of. And so if you write with a pencil, right, or you try and create graphene some other way, you will find that it's a pretty small fraction of the volume of material is gonna be in, the, in this graphene form, a single layer or just a few layers. The other thing is that it's, it's kind of hard to see it if you look in a electron microscope, there's not a lot of contrast. It's, it's pretty transparent, not just to visible light, but also to uh, electrons and to lots of kinds of radiation because there's not a lot of atomic mass and the materials, the materials are really thin. And so you have this transparency, which makes it hard to see, uh, both in an electron or in a, a light microscope. Really, the, the best way to do it is with an atomic force microscope, right? And, and what you could do is you could look on the paper, right? If you wrote on a paper and you look at it in profile, well, you might see, so an atomic force microscope is just like a stylus that moves over the surface. Well, you might see a bump that's at the height that you would expect this uh, layer of, of graphite to be. Uh, but that's, that would take a long time. So that's... Uh, that's great, and I think a big demotivator for searching for graphene, despite knowing it would be interesting for, you know, about 60 years before it was discovered, was there was a lot of theory that a single atomic layer of material just wouldn't be stable enough to exist for a long time. And, uh, you know, that's kind of evidence, maybe you've seen something like melting point depression. So gold melts at some temperature like 1060 C, but if you have a nanoparticle of gold, just uh, say a 10 nanometer diameter nanoparticle, that nanoparticle is gonna melt at like 250 degrees C. And the reason why is because there's a lot less atomic bonds to hold those atoms together. The surface to area ratio is huge. And so the number of atomic bonds in that volume of material is, is small. And so it takes less energy to break all those bonds apart and that's manifested as its change in, in melting temperature. So the idea that having so few atoms together just wouldn't be stable, just wouldn't stay together, was a kind of motivation to not hunt for, for graphene. And so in the early, uh, in, the, in the 2000s, there was work done to try and identify a graphene and people tried some different ways uh, there's some early papers where people took a graphite crystal and used an afm and tried to smear it on the surface like a deck of cards and uh, that was somewhat effective but but those studies aren't very high profile especially compared to this early work of dime and the Voselab. and all they did is they took the crystal and it's just like the, the graphite crystal is just like that mica crystal 
right? You've got these covalently bound layers of carbon and they're held together with these weak electrostatic forces. And you can just pull them apart with ordinary scotch tape. Like it's literally the scotch tape that you would buy at the, the grocery store. And you can pull these crystals apart until you have just one layer. <laughs> and uh, it sounds very easy, but uh, it's pretty painstaking and not super fun to, to tear it apart. You can see it start to get transparent. And then you can start to measure with the atomic force microscope to see how thick it is. Uh, and then all kinds of work came about. So you can see from the contrast, if you put it on a silicon oxide wafer, you can tell from the contrast if it's a single layer or not. People develop some tricks and tools that make it easy to characterize a graphene so that you don't have to uh, just rely on your, your uh, atomic force microscope, which is kind of a, a low throughput type of characterization process. So not only did they, <laughs> Not only did Gaiman de Vosilev kind of make graphene and discover it, and here's what it looks like if you transfer a graphene flake onto a silicon oxide wafer, you can see that uh, kind of light blue or blue area on this purple background, you can see the graphene. And then you can just see it with uh, optical microscope, which makes it, makes it really easy because of this uh, interference effect. But they made some devices, they made some transistor devices out of graphene. And uh, they made some really cool discoveries confirming the theoretical work that was done in 1947. And so if you think about what is special about graphene is uh, its, its thermal conductivity, its strength, and its charge transport properties. These are really uh, effects of its electronic so this is like the, the energy of a particular electron in a carbon atom. Let's just say that, that, let's just imagine that. And think about the things that the energy of an electron and an atom depend on. Well, it depends on how many protons are in the nucleus, and it depends on how far it is away from those protons, right? So the spacing of the electron relative to the, the spacing of the electron relative to the nucleus dictates its energy. And uh, so also, yeah, I guess that's it. Then that affects its energy in two ways. It affects its proximity to the nucleus, not just of the atom of interest, right? So I'm gonna draw this Bohr model of an atom. So the electron is out here and its distance dictates its energy to some extent, as well as its velocity, right? Around the nucleus that gives it some centripetal force that keeps it from getting accelerated into the nucleus. But its position, relative to this nucleus also dictates its position next to an adjacent carbon atom nucleus, right? And so if you imagine the energy of the electron being affected by the, let's just say position of the electron in an atom or in this structure, then you can see how the energy varies. And what's interesting is at this point, you've got this line, right? And so you can imagine that this is like a, this is like a valence I'm sorry, this is like a uh, valence electron and this is like a conduction electron. And so right here, you have this junction and there's no energy gap. So the electron can go freely from the valence band to the conduction band at this particular position when the electron is, is located at this position relative to the atom. That makes this special surface here. Right, so the electronic structure of graphene, it's, graphene has this free pi electron that's free to conduct, and you can imagine this plane of conduction that basically has no barrier. The electron is going to move as if it has no mass. And so this incredible charge transport property is, is kind of the, the hallmark of what sets graphene apart from other materials. So if you think about carbon, here's its electron configuration. And if you fill up the uh, electronic orbitals, you end up with one s orbital that's full, right? It's got two electrons. And then you have one electron in each of these pi orbitals or p orbitals, right? So there's an electron in this one, an electron in this one, and this one's free, 
these two are de degenerate. They have the same energy. And so the electron is going to go into the lowest possible energy orbital. It's going to leave this one vacant. And it's these, this empty space up here, right? It's, uh, it's basically just available to uh, conduct uh, current, conduct an electron current. And so the electronic properties of graphene are, are kind of dictated by this electronic structure. So if you want to build an electronic device, usually you're going to, a lot of important electronic devices like a transistor, they depend on the semiconducting properties of the material where you can get the semiconducting material to be a good conductor and you can make it be a bad conductor. And you can control when it's demonstrating these properties, oftentimes by applying a, a gate voltage, right? So you can dope the material and uh, reduce the energy barrier from the valence band to the conduction band. So graphene, it's got this point at which those energies meet and really doesn't have a band gap. There's no barrier for electronic conduction in this material. So its electronic structure you know, gives rise to these incredible properties. So you've got a factor of 10 increase of electron mobility in graphene compared to silicon, right? A kind of typical semiconducting material. It's got a, a thermal conductivity that's higher than, than diamond and uh, is easy to integrate into materials. It's a lot less expensive to produce graphene and so using some of the techniques that we'll talk about than it is to produce, uh, produce diamond. It's got this super strength, right? 130 gigapascals compared to, you know, kind of more normal strengths for, for you know, ordinary strong materials. It's transparent. And uh, it's just a, a demonstration. If nothing else, graphene was the gateway to realizing that the thickness of materials is a powerful parameter that allows us to control their properties. So if we take graphene for just that, that's, that's good. Graphene is one part of the equation because if we want to build an electronic device, we really need to have also semiconducting materials and insulating materials. You can induce a band gap in graphene. There's a couple of ways to do it. The band gap is still small, but you can make the material be nanostructures. You can take this super thin material and then you can make it so, you know, it's like one carbon atom thick. And then you can make it just a few nanometers wide and tall. And when you do that, you can make this graphene nano ribbon and you can induce this additional layer of confinement by making the material be small. And so this is just a schematic, right? So this is what the electronic structure looks like. There's zero band gap between the conduction, the valence band and the conduction band. Here, if you if you take a, a graphene nano ribbon, you can see what happens to the band gap. So pay attention to this unit here. This is in milli electron volts, right? So this 10 to the third is one electron volt. That's around the band gap of silicon. And so you can see that graphene has this teeny tiny band gap between one and 10 milli electron volts. And as you reduce the dimensions of these ribbons, the width of these uh, graphene nano ribbons, you can slowly get up to the kind of band gap of silicon. That's for a one nanometer wide graphene nano ribbon. So, not necessarily scalable for electronics, but definitely a nice demonstration of again how the dimensions of a material impact its properties. So, making the material thin is one way to do it. You can also kind of dope the material. You can induce. Uh, an electronic response by covering the surface with different kinds of compounds. And so this is just a, just a demonstration of the change in band gap as you cover the surface of the material with a particular type of molecule. So nanostructuring is one way, doping is another way, but really we can never get to the type of band gaps that we really want, you know, kind of one EV type of band gaps. So graphene was, was all the rage in, in 2004 on, in 2010, Tony Hines and his group at Columbia, they did the same thing that was done with graphite with another crystal that's really easy to clean. It's another hexagonal crystal with strong covalent bonding in the kind of XY plane and weak Van der Waals bonding in the Z direction and just tore it apart using scotch tape. 
and they discovered the electronic properties of MOS2, they changed. So MOS2 is a material that had been studied for, for decades, uh, mostly for its use as a, a solid lubricant material because its, its structure where it's got all these atomic layers, it's really easy to shear. We talked about some of the initial works on graphene being an exercise in, in kind of smearing this, this uh, pile of atomic layers out and trying to get to a single atomic layer. Well, MOS2 was recognized for this uh, atomic structure and the resulting properties. And it was well known to have an indirect band gap of about 1.3 eV. And so again, this is another one of these these diagrams where you see the energy between the valence band and the conduction band, and there's an energy barrier for, for electrons to cross. And when a material has a band gap, that makes it useful as a transistor because you can turn that, uh, you, can make, you can tune that band gap. You can make it it's full size, 1.3 V, or you can make it smaller to facilitate electron, uh, electron conduction. When MOS2 was in a very thin form, there is a change in the electronic structure, and you have this direct band gap that is about 1.8 eVy. And, and a direct band gap compared to an indirect band gap just results, it's like a, a statistical probability of photon emission upon relaxation of the electron. If you want this material to, to shine light or to emit light, you're going to have to send light into the material to excite the electrons. And then when the electrons relax, they'll emit light. Well, when you have a direct band gap material, the quantum efficiency is a lot higher. That is, for every incident photon, you get a lot more photons out. And so for MOS2, you can get the quantum efficiency to be about one. For every photon in it, you get a, a photon out, which is high, much higher than it is for the bulk material, which has this indirect band gap, which is something that has a, a lower probability of, of uh, occurring in terms of electronic excitation and relaxation. So this is, a, this is just a, to orient us in the structure of MOS2 if it's something we're not really familiar with. Again, and, and all the transition metal that calcogenides have a, a similar hexagonal structure. So not only MOS2, which is what we're focused on here, kind of the most common two-dimensional uh, transition metal by calcogenide, but there are lots of other transition metals that we can use, and uh, there are a few other calcogens selenium and uh, uh, tellurium are really the, the primary uh, alternatives to silicon or to sulfur rather, but sulfur is the, the most common and, and one of the most uh, best understood and most useful. So again, we've got more of these diagrams, this time for these transition metal dicalcogenides. And so you can see we've got four different materials in this little cluster of graphs and these are the electron energy diagrams for MOS2, MOSE2, WS2, and WSE2. And this is for bulk material. And so you can see this indirect band gap for all four of these different transition metals. Now as you make it thinner, so this is two layers here for each of the four materials, you can see you start to open up this, uh, this gap. So the band gap is here. This is like the lowest energy step to get an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And now, if you look at the landscape, it's a little different. It looks like uh, there's some different places. The band gap's kind of opening up. But for these monolayer materials, when you go from bilayer to monolayer, each of these four materials has a direct band gap, and they all have a different size. And so this is kind of cool. We talked about layering these materials up. If you take a material with kind of a large band gap and couple it with a material with a smaller band gap, guess what? You're going to get a band gap that's kind of in the middle. So now we have a way of putting these materials together in these heterostructures to get whatever band gap we want. Right? And this is really useful because the, uh, the band gap is going to dictate the wavelength at which we get emission. And so we can do some tuning of the uh, light emission from these materials by stacking them up together or just by selecting the material that gives us the band gap that we want. 
you know, this slide is just an explanation of how the how to kind of interpret these energy diagrams. I'm not going to spend uh, spend time on that right now. There's some other things I'd rather spend time on. So, I mentioned before that that one of the downsides of graphing is it was kind of one dimensional in, in a sense, and that's that it's really only good as a, a conductor. It's not a great transistor. It's not a great material to integrate into a transistor as the the active switching part of the transistor. Um, for transition metal dichalcogenides, there are, are many different varieties in this family of materials, and you can predict whether or not they're going to be conducting or semiconducting just by looking at the electron configuration of the metal comprised of the transition metal dichalcogenide. So. This is maybe a little different than what you'd expect. These electron configurations aren't necessarily the way that you'd expect them to go. Um, and that's just because when you put a, a single element in a compound, well, that kind of changes the energy distribution of the electrons, just like we saw in the, these complicated diagrams, right? The electron energy changes depending on the proximity of the electron to the nucleus. And so if I'm putting niobium, in some kind of transition metal dichalcogenide compound, uh, NBS2 or NBSE2, it's going to change the energy. Which, which electron has the lowest energy is going to change. So these electron configurations may look a little weird. You'd probably get a, a bad grade if this was a freshman chemistry test and you put this down. But when these elements are in these compounds, these are the electron configurations. And if the electron configuration, if it's full, right? And so what do I mean by full? Well, if I draw the 4D orbital, there's gonna be five places. And if I think about Hund's rule, where I take five electrons with the same spin, those are gonna occupy those orbitals first. And then if I had you know, an extra D electron, it would occupy this orbital with the opposite spin. Well, in this case, I've got every every one of these slots is filled with an electron. And if that's the case for your metal, then you're gonna have a semiconducting material. If not, if it's not all the way full, then you're gonna have a conductive material. And so this niobium, uh, these niobium-based transition metal like calcogenides are gonna be more metallic and they're gonna be conductive in nature. So this is nice. We have a way of, of predicting which material is gonna give us what kind of properties and it's pretty straightforward. So I mentioned before that you can take these materials and put them together and get different kinds of properties. So again, if I have a bulk tungsten sulfide crystal, I've got this small and direct band gap. I've got tungsten sulfide and it's a single layer. I have this big direct band gap. I don't went from 0.88 dV to 1.94 dV. And then I can take a layer of MOS2 and WS2 and I can still maintain this direct band gap, but I can tune it. I can make the value smaller. 1.94 is, is a large, it's a relatively large band gap for transition metal by calcogenides. I think the largest is uh, about 2.3. All right, so that's just a, a little bit of, of why 2D materials are, are fundamentally interesting. Let's talk about how to make them. So we talked about the first Scotch tape based synthesis of graphene, we're gonna call that mechanical exfoliation. So exfoliation is just like peeling things apart. And uh, if it's done mechanically, it's, it's done with just with uh, physical force, right? Using your fingers to pull the tape apart. And so there's just kind of a schematic of how we get there from a bulk graphite crystal, which looks like this, uh, at least a, a particular grain in this uh, graphite chunk will be oriented this way and then you can isolate a single layer. So what's nice about this mechanical exfoliation technique is that this is a way to get the least defective graphene. The other techniques we're going to talk about, the graphene has more atomic scale defects in it. And those defects are going to affect its properties, sometimes in a good way, sometimes not. There's some issues here. I mean, imagine what happens. You, you pull the scotch tape together, or spool the, <laughs> Pull the scotch tape apart. And then you probably want to get the graphene from the scotch tape onto some kind of 
you know, more standard electronics grade substrate, like oxidized silicon wafer. And so usually what you have to do is once you isolate a single layer of graphene on the scotch tape, is you dissolve away the scotch tape in some kind of solvent, you scoop up the graphite, graphene, and then you lay it onto a uh, substrate. And so this is not a, a <laughs> very feasible way to make lots of devices or, or material. And so mechanical exfoliation is generally done for fundamental studies where you want low defect density. There's going to be thickness variations over a large area, but you can get small areas on the orders of microns or tens of microns that are, are the same thickness and are relatively defect free. This is a nice way to do fundamental studies on, on graphene. And think about what you have to do. Now you've got to take this to some kind of nanofabrication facility and use like electron beam lithography to make some contacts on that graphene. You want to probe its uh, electronic and optical properties. Liquid phase exfoliation is a variation on, on mechanical exfoliation where you take a big chunk of graphite, you put it in a solvent, and then you use this uh, technique called ultrasonication. So this is a common technique for cleaning substrates like physical vapor deposition and other types of deposition processes. And you rely on this process of cavitation where there's bubbles that form from the energy input into the solvent those bubbles coalesce on the surface of the crystal and actually make it blow apart. So the solvent that you select is going to help determine the stability of the suspension. So you're going to have all these little flakes of graphene in your suspension. You probably don't want them all to either aggregate together or to settle to the bottom. And so you can select the uh, surface energy or surface tension of the solvent to match that of the graphene, and that's going to reduce the driving force for, for aggregation. So when you introduce this concept of, of sonication, you're, you're going to kind of uh, blow these crystals apart, like we said before. And uh, this, this is OK. You can introduce defects this way a few in a few different ways. First of all, you've got the solvent that's hanging around, right? And if you make a defect, that's going to become a really chemically reactive site. And so you may have some doping of the graphene by the ambient solvent. If you crank up the power to generate a high rate of dissociation of these crystals, you're going to introduce more defects because some of that energy is going to go into the material and the energy can be enough. The energy associated with these cavitation events where bubbles coalesce on the surface and then they uh, basically explode and make the material fall apart, that can induce enough energy to make defects as well. So ultimately you can use a centrifuge to separate the graphene of different thickness, right? Each of these layers, there's going to be a different buoyancy force depending on the thickness of these particular layers. And uh, you can use a centrifuge so that you have a higher, you know, if you take the force acting downward, which is going to be the gravitational force minus the buoyancy force of these little flakes. So that gets to be bigger than the drag force, the force associated with the particles moving through the solvent, then you can get separation of these uh, of these particles. So this is a way to make a suspension. You can use the suspension of particles as like an ink in some kind of like 3D printer, right? Like an aerosol jet printer or some other additive manufacturing device. That's one common use for these. There's other things you can do with these collections of particles. But this is a way to make a, a large number of graphene flakes. They're going to be small and you're still confined to some of the same challenges. You've got to take these out and get them onto a substrate somehow. Again, it's not really scalable per se, maybe via printing. Uh, there's some challenges associated with printing that we'll talk about in a second. To make large area two-dimensional materials, chemical vapor deposition is one of the most common techniques. And so it's, it's fairly straightforward. You flow some precursor gas, some gas that's going to make the compound you want once it thermally decomposes. And it's going to thermally decompose after it absorbs on the surface of your substrate. The gas will decompose. You'll have some volatile products that leave the surface. Uh, 
and the components of your material that you want will, will stay behind. And depending on some of the kinetics here, you may have fusion, you may be able to control the structure depending on temperature. Once you exceed the threshold temperature for the gas stage reaction to occur, lots of times these processes are self-limiting. That is, once you have gas built up on the surface, one layer, then you decompose it. Well, you may or may not have a driving force for gas to react with the layer that's left behind. And so sometimes the thickness can be controlled based on the interactions between the material you're trying to make through this decomposition of the precursor and the gas precursor that's absorbing on the surface. So this is kind of a, a common schematic for chemical vapor deposition process. You can load up a bunch of substrates, slow the precursor gas over the substrates, and heat all the substrates to a, a similar temperature uniformly and have a uniform film deposited on the surface. The spacing between the substrates is sometimes important, and there's other characteristic lengths that are important, especially when you compare them to the, the flow rate of the gas, right? So these precursor molecules are gonna have some kind of mean free path. That's the distance, the average distance that they travel before they, they have a encounter with some kind of surface or some other molecule. It depends on, on what your perspective is. Until they hit something, you can define that as a mean free path. And then this L is just the characteristic length of the system. And that characteristic length, it could be the distance between the source and the substrate, or it could be the distance between the substrates. It just depends on what you're trying to model. But this ratio of the two is called the Newton number. And this Newton number can be useful for achieving the kinds of kinetics that you want on the surface. So in some cases, you need a catalyst to form graphene. And so we're gonna talk about mostly metallic catalysts. Nickel and copper are two common substrates for graphene growth via chemical vapor deposition. And so if you want this kind of dissolution in the catalyst, that's maybe more relevant for nickel substrates than for copper, but you can adjust the process parameters. That is, what is the flow rate of the gas compared to the spacing between the substrates or the spacing from the source of the gas? And you can determine the kinetics based on this, this pretty simple calculation. So I mentioned nickel and copper as two common metallic substrates for graphene growth. And the way that the graphene grows is very different on both of these substrates. So for nickel, there's a pretty high solubility of carbon at a pretty high temperature. So you can see on this scale, right, this is the percent carbon. You can get, you know, at the maximum temperature, you get something like three, four percent carbon dissolved in nickel. And so for growth of graphene on nickel, what you do is you dissolve the carbon into the nickel at high temperature, then you cool it down and you get precipitation of carbon. It, it, uh, it precipitates out as a graphene layer on the surface. This is not so common anymore. Initially, people or use this technique to grow graphene, but growing on copper is much, much, much more common. And this is more like a typical uh, chemical vapor deposition technique, at least in my mind, I think of these techniques. The solubility of carbon and copper is small. Notice the scale here. This is uh, the maximum solubility is at like 0.007% carbon, and that's at 1100 degrees, right? That's like the maximum solubility. And so the Carbon just nucleates and grows on the surface of this copper substrate. And uh, you're able to grow these continuous layers. Uh, of course, once you grow it on the copper, <laughs> if you want to do any kind of characterization, you need to move it to a different substrate because your measurements, if you do any kind of electronic property measurements, you're probably going to measure the properties of the copper, not the, the graphene. So in terms of precursor gases, there's a, a lot of uh, very uh, common, very inexpensive precursor gases for development of graphene films on either nickel or copper. But you can see just this cartoon of, of this nucleation and growth. And you can control, to some extent, you can control the grain boundary density of your graphene based on the grain boundary density of your copper substrate, right? Just because that's going to be a contributor to the number of nucleation sites you have. So if you want to have more coarse-grained graphene, 
you probably want to start out with a more coarse grain copper substrate because you're going to have preferential nucleation at, at grain boundaries. So here are just some examples of different recipes for making graphene. And I think it's, it's interesting to look at something like this because you can see kind of typical precursors, right? Methane, hydrogen are, are a common combination of, of precursors. Uh, there's other, other precursors that work as well. You can grow graphene from just about anything. And there's actually a lot of papers that show, you know, growing graphene from, you know, tequila as a precursor and dog poop and, and other precursors as well. But methane is, is a really common one. You see the temperature's high. Right, so this is a challenge because you could never process graphene directly on like a, a flexible insulating substrate uh, at these kinds of temperatures. So even, you know, even glass would be a stretch at a thousand degrees C. And uh, so this is, uh, this is just an overview of different recipes for growing graphene. Once you grow it, like we're talking about, you probably want to get it to another substrate. And so a common way to do that is to spin coat a polymer on the surface. So this is kind of like our scotch tape equivalent. And then you can dissolve the copper away in an acid that will preferentially etch metal over the graphene or the polymer. Then you rescue the graphene on this polymer. You dissolve it away. So you, so you take this combination of the polymer and the graphene, you stick it on the surface, you dissolve the polymer away and you're left with graphene on an oxidized silicon wafer or the substrate of your choice. There's some challenges here. So it's not like an exfoliated crystal. Now I've got some, some grain boundaries. I may have some cracks uh, in this transfer process. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging to smoothly adhere the graphene onto the surface. You may have some, some ripples. And you can see these surfaces here. So this is an atomic force microscope scan of the surface and you can see some tall spots. These correspond to, to ripples in the graphene uh, over this line scan on this material. But you can see the graphene is not nearly as pristine or defect free as it is in a mechanical exfoliation technique, but it's huge, right? This is a very large area compared to the areas we we're looking at before. And so it's a little bit of a trade-off most of the time. If you want large areas, you're gonna to have to put up with some, some defects. There's other ways to transfer the material. So you can use a material called thermal tape. Thermal tape, it'll be sticky at one temperature and not sticky at a different temperature. And so you can make this transition. You can stick it to a graphene surface on copper, peel the graphene off, then take the graphene and the tape combination, stick it on the substrate you want, heat it up just with like a heat gun, and then the tape will just fall off and the graphene will adhere to the surface. And so this kind of technique can be scaled up and applied to, to large areas. This is not gonna be a high quality, it's not this graphene over this 30 inch span not going to have that ultra high you know mobility that we talked about before a factor of 10 higher than silicon but it's still going to demonstrate some properties and it's neat i mean without uh without trying these kinds of techniques to transfer large areas to substances, we, we may never get to realize some of the benefits of these 2d materials and there's some other techniques that we'll just talk about briefly. Some of them are, are more amenable for large areas and don't require transfer like graphene does. So this is just kind of a, a typical recipe for direct deposition of uh, 2D materials on silicon oxide. So we saw growth on a growth of graphene on copper. The transition metal dicalcogenides are a little more forgiving in terms of the substrates. You can't really grow graphene directly on silicon oxide very well or an oxidized silicon wafer very well. But for MOS2, you can. And so that's kind of an advantage of these transition metal dicalcogenides. So early experiments of growth of MOS2 involve sputtering a thin layer or evaporation of a thin layer of molybdenum. And then you can introduce sulfur a couple of different ways. You can either take a solid sulfur powder and uh, heat it up. It doesn't take much heat. Sulfur melts at like 110 degrees C. So its vapor pressure is pretty high. You just need a little bit of heat and you can introduce sulfur to this molybdenum substrate at high temperature 
and induce uh, sulfurization of the molybdenum and, and create MOS2, which is stable. At the, it's the most stable phase of molybdenum sulfide is this hexagonal MOS2 phase. Another way to do it is to take moly trioxide powder and then uh, the sulfur will substitute for the oxygen at high temperature. And you can grow MOS2 this way directly on surfaces. What's interesting is when you grow MOS2 in this way, you typically end up with these triangles. And the triangles will demonstrate different degrees of continuity. Usually they're isolated from one another. And we'll talk about how that happens in just a second. Uh, another way to process MOS2 is you can take the metal and process it in a, a gas like hydrogen sulfide or hydrogen selenide. This is a really excellent way to make materials because it's easy to control the thickness of a metal layer, right? You can easily make very thin molybdenum layers. It may or may not be continuous, but recent, there's been some recent developments that uh, have shown these very continuous large area films of MOS2. And so you can expose it at high temperature, this uh, hydrogen sulfide or hydrogen selenide, but these gases are super toxic. If you're conscientious about your workplace environment, you're going to have to invest a lot of money in terms of sensitive because even you know, parts per million of H2S or H2S, SH2SE, they can cause pretty serious neurological uh, damage. So you do you really do need to be careful if you're trying to go this route. So why did these triangles form? You can see, so there was an artificially induced nucleation site put here to get lots of nucleation of MOS2 on the surface. And then there's just kind of a normal density of nucleation sites out here. These MOS2 clusters form in this triangular shape just because the surface energy at these three faces is equivalent. And you can see that here. If you consider, this is kind of a side view of MOS2 that we saw before. If you look at it from the top, you can see you've got this edge with metal atoms. There, the blue atoms are metal in this case. This edge and this edge. These edges all look like this if you look at them face on, right? If your eyeball was right here, this is what you would see. And these metal, these unterminated metal atoms are really reactive. They have a really high surface energy. And so growth is going to occur at these particular faces. And so on these crystals, you end up with growth, you know, termination of sulfur at these particular faces. And then you can, you know, you can imagine that the kinetics enable further growth in these different directions. But these triangles come just because of the geometry and surface energy associated with the particular facets of these crystals as they grow. And so this is the typical configuration. You can see all these metal terminated edges in this triangular shape, and that's the direction that growth will occur in as you have this molybdenum source being exposed to uh, sulfur or selenium vapor. There's a few other alternatives that aren't as well uh, studied or as intensively reported in the literature, but you can do, you can take these different uh, compounds like uh, this, uh, what's it, molybdenum thiol, thiol molybdate, sodium thiol molybdate. And you can dip coat these compounds on a surface and then just decompose them thermally. And it takes about a thousand degrees to take this, this material and turn it into, uh, turn this into uh, transition metal dichalcogenide. MOCVD is another technique. So you take these exotic precursor gases, which have metal content. And you mix them together with something that contains a calcogen, and you can process this way. This is a high temperature process, and the downside is that these precursors are really, really toxic. And so it's a little bit expensive and a little bit dangerous to process materials this way, and it takes pretty high temperature. The quality of the materials is, is okay, but it, you definitely get large areas. There's atomic layer deposition where you take some of those exotic precursors and you alternate their insertion into the chamber so that you can control the formation of atomic layers. This is not very common, 
for transition metal dichalcogenides, but it is a way to get there. Uh, again, some of the same side effects. It's, it's a little bit dangerous to use these precursors. Sputtering is another way to produce two-dimensional transition metal dichalcogenides. And so this is, uh, again, this is, this is nice because you're getting some kinetic energy from the plasma. Uh, the species that land on the substrate, they can diffuse at lower temperatures and you can get the nucleation and growth that you need to make pretty high quality 2D transition metal dichalcogenides. And, infinitely scalable. So this is an attractive method for making large area films. Another kind of more recent and less known approach is to take, to just sputter the precursor MOS2 in the amorphous state and use a laser to crystallize it. And this is kind of useful because you can do this directly on a flexible substrate. The MOS2 will selectively absorb the laser, and the laser will just penetrate through most polymers like PDMS, depending on the wavelength that you use and the polymer that you use. So in this case, PDMS is a, a high temperature, stability, uh, ultra smooth, very flexible polymer substrate. And you can induce these you know, high temperature reactions on the surface without decomposing the PDMS, it still maintains it. Uh, mechanical properties it stays stretchable. So these two-dimensional materials you can strain them about 10 percent before they rupture which is more than lots of substrates although not PDMS. PDMS is a super stretchy substrate. and the advantage is that you can make it very smooth because these films are you know one to three nanometers thick so the roughness needs to be less than that for the, the properties of the material to be manifest. These are just some, some more detailed examples of what happens when you crystallize a material on the surface. So if you look at the TEM, you can see the amorphous material. There's no order. Once it's been annealed, once it's exposed to the laser, then you get this kind of perfect ordering on the surface. You can do this uh, technique. You can sputter multiple precursors on top of each other and then anneal them simultaneously with the laser. And this is a, a pretty uh, effective way to obtain some heterostructures. We talked about the benefits of these, right? They have two very different band gaps for these materials, and you can put them together and, and tune the band gap. Different numbers of layers of materials with different, different band gaps. We mentioned chemical exfoliation. This is where you take a solvent and you apply this ultrasonicating energy to break up a crystal. And you make a stable, you can make a stable suspension of these 2D particles. And then you could use something like an aerosol jet printer, right, where you flow gas in, you flow a fluid in, and you atomize this fluid kind of like in like a spray bottle or something. And then you shoot it through a nozzle, and the nozzle is steered over a substrate in a particular pattern. There's a lot of, of challenges associated with printing these suspensions, but it is another way to make large area uh, aggregations of particles that can behave collectively. Uh, they can demonstrate those similar properties as a, a monolithic film of 2D materials. I kind of jokingly mentioned before that characterization of these materials is a little challenging. They're super duper thin. There's three techniques that are, there's four techniques that are really common. There's transmission electron microscopy, which I'm not really gonna talk about, but that's uh, really a nice way to look, especially at transmission metal dichalcogenides because there's a bunch of features that you can, you can see. You can see everything in the TM. You can see the number of defects. You can see um, you know, the size of the grain boundaries, everything you wanna know about these materials you can see in the TEM, but that's a really low throughput technique too, right? It takes a lot of time to make a TEM sample and uh, it takes a lot of time to use TEM to see these things in the sample. But these are three really high throughput techniques and you can learn just about everything you need to know from each of these three. So from XPS, I'm not gonna talk about it much today, but you can see if you have um, uh, you can learn a few different things about the material just in terms of its composition, but you can also measure its thickness uh, just by looking at these uh, ratios of signals from the substrate and from the material itself. There's some papers on that. And so that's kind of nice because that's a, a really important parameter is uh, being able to know, is this really a 2D material or not? That's something everyone wants to know. If you write a paper about 2D materials, you have to show some proof that it really is the thickness that you say it is.
Uh, atomic force microscopy is another really nice technique for that. So as long as you have a step, you can see the uh, change in height from the substrate to the material that you got. But I want to talk about Raman spectroscopy because this is really the heavy artillery in terms of 2D materials characterization. You can learn so many things about the material, including you can make sure that it's the material you want it to be, right? So you can tell if it's MOS2 or not. You can tell if it's crystalline. You can tell how thick it is. You can tell how big the crystals are, like the grain boundary size. And uh, there's a lot of other things that you can tell from Raman spectroscopy. So let's just take a look. XPS is important, I should mention, for this uh, reason shown here. We're talking about materials that are a few atomic layers thick. It's not easy to collect a larger accumulation of contaminant atoms than atoms of interest. Uh, if you let the sample sit out for an extended period of time, they're going to collect hydrocarbons on the surface that are a comparable thickness to the material itself. And there's also some, uh, some issues with oxidation uh, in the ambient environment. So some, here's an example of a material that was processed and uh, the XPS spectrum was measured in situ, like as it was processed. It was exposed to the lab air for one hour. 15% humidity is pretty low. That's like uh, the humidity level this time of year in winter time when the air conditioner is running and it's not very heat, or the heater is running and it's not very humid outside. You still get some oxidation as evidenced by this uh, oxidation state of plus six. So knowing what you've got in terms of composition is important. It's a little bit dynamic. So if you've ever seen a Raman spectrometer before, there's usually some some kind of common ingredients. Most of the time we want to use a, a like a Raman microscope. And what that enables is focusing of the excitation laser in a particular area that you can see through the microscope itself. And this is nice, it gives you a high uh, laser power density and gives you a, a large signal from the material as well. But the way that this works is you've got a laser that comes in, interacts with the sample, scattered light from the sample goes right back through the same objective lens and then it gets analyzed through here and there's a detector back here. And so this detector is going to be used once the, the spectrum of scattered light is analyzed with a, a grating. So the excitation laser interacts with the atoms in the sample and what's going to happen is you can get some interaction between the laser, which is just some kind of electromagnetic wave, and its alternating electric field is going to have an impact on the oscillation of the electrons in that atom. And so when you make those electrons move around, you're going to change their, their energy, right? We saw in those, uh, those energy diagrams that the position of the electrons affects our energy. Well, I can affect the position of the electrons with this alternating electric field make the electron energy change. And that change in energy is going to result in a change in the frequency of the scattered light that comes back. So this is a, a complicated equation explaining the polarization of a material. Raman spectroscopy only works in materials that can be polarized. So it doesn't work in most metals, for example, right? Because it's hard to polarize a metal. The electrons can just kind of freely float around the nuclei. They don't really uh, separate one to another. And so you can only use Raman spectroscopy on materials that polarize. And when you shine a light on the surface, let's say that light has a frequency V naught, you can see that a few things will happen. The light will be scattered back at its original frequency, but then there'll be some light that's scattered back at a lower energy, right? A lower frequency, the initial frequency minus some quantity, this frequency of vibration associated with the movement of the electrons and movement of the atoms. Look at this, you're gonna get some light that's scattered back with a higher frequency or a higher energy. It seems impossible. It seems like I'm just explaining something that's a violation of the first law, but it's not really true. You're cheating a little bit. You're counting on an excitation that hasn't fully relaxed. That electron gets excited to an even higher energy level and then relaxes all the way and emits a photon of an even higher intensity. So this is the this this is the light that I'm looking for in the Raman spectrometer. It's getting scattered back at a different energy than the incident radiation. 
and I can learn some things about what's happening to the material. So here's the same polarization equation. When I have this polarization, well, I'm going to have some atomic displacement. And the atomic displacement is going to come from, again, interactions with this incident electric and electric field and maybe also from just the deposition of energy into the material from the laser. And so these vibrations of these atoms is gonna be quantized, right? There's only certain vibrations that can occur. And these vibrations are gonna induce changes in the polarizability. So a molecule is gonna have some polarizability in its equilibrium configuration. Polariz polarization is just separation of, of charge, right? So electrons from the protons. We're concentrating electrons in one area over another. When I make the bonds shorter, well, then I'm making it harder to move the electrons because now the influence, let's say if I consider an electron that's part of atom B, when atom A comes closer, its nucleus is also going to start to affect the position of this electron. It's going to make it harder to remove this electron from the atom or excite it because this nucleus is holding on to it as well as this nucleus. And so when I squash the atoms together, when I displace them from this incident laser, I can make polarization more difficult. I can make it easier by stretching the atoms out. And so as these atoms are uh, exhibiting this cyclic motion in the midst of this laser excitation, then I can inhibit or promote polarizability. And so you can see for, this is polarizability on the y-axis. In the equilibrium position, my material needs to have some polarizability at zero displacement. And then I can see the change in polarization as the material is squashed, right? As I move the atoms closer together, I make it harder to polarize. And as I pull the atoms apart, I make it easier to polarize. And so this kind of diagram is useful for understanding whether or not a material is gonna exhibit a, a Raman response. So taking these ideas into account, it can help us to understand how we can use Raman spectroscopy to identify characteristics of 2D materials and do things like measure their thickness. So again, this is a, a much easier technique than certainly than transmission electron microscopy and quite a bit easier than atomic force microscopy as well. And so we can look at these different features. So we've got four different kinds of materials. We have just like a nice crystal of graphite. And then we have some different thin films of graphene. And so this graphene here is only five atomic, it's less than five atomic layers thick. Here's this thick graphite. And you can see this change in this peak. It's referred to as the 2D peak. It's not referring to the fact that it's two dimensional. But by analysis of the shape of this peak, you can see these differences in the thickness of the material. You can also see the G and the D peak. In a perfect graphite crystal, you have a very strong G peak in contrast to the D peak. So we can consider this to be like graphite-like bonding. That peak's associated with graphite-like bonding. And so we can think of these particular vibrations that are allowed in the crystal. Well, for strong graphite, there's a particular vibration associated with its structure, and you're gonna get a large polarization as those atoms come apart in that particular configuration. This D peak represents what's called a defect peak. And so you can see in this thin film with small flakes, we've got lots of defects, lots of grain boundaries, or lots of edges in the crystal, and it gives us a big D peak. But we also have a big G peak indicating that the crystalline ordering is very much like it is in graphite for this thin material, which is less than five layers thick. So there are many, many papers you can look at that help that can help you to understand how can I look at this Raman spectrum from a material like graphene 
and know the quality of the material. That's generally a, a, considering the ratio of the magnitude of the G peak to the magnitude of the D peak, where a larger G peak is indicating high crystalline quality. And analysis of the shape of this 2D peak, and you can fit these peaks and understand kind of how much of the volume of material radiated by the laser is, uh, is gonna be showing here. So this is just a zoomed in view of those 2D peaks, right? And you can see how different they are from each other. And a map like this can help you to orient yourself around your particular sample. So for molybdenum disulfide and other transition metal dichalcogenides, you can see, so these are some examples of these quantized atomic vibrations that are allowed in the crystals. Right, and so you can see, you can imagine what's happening to these atoms in terms of polarizability. So here we have the E2G peak that corresponds to this type of vibration, kind of in plane, right, in the plane of these crystals. And here we have the A1G peak, this is kind of out of plane of these crystals. And you can see these two vibrational peaks represented here in these spectral features. And what's interesting about two dimensional MOS2 is you can see that as the material gets thinner and thinner and thinner, this is the number of layers, six layers all the way down to one layer, you can see that this peak moves to a lower energy and this peak moves to a higher energy. And that's kind of interesting. If you think about what's going on here, as I have fewer and fewer layers, I have less and less electrons and nuclei that can affect the displacement of these atoms down here. So if I think about this bottom layer, it's weighed down by all these layers on top, and it's got these additional nuclei that can affect the ability of this nucleus to move around, it certainly can affect the ability of these electrons to be polarized. So as I reduce the number of layers, it seems reasonable that uh, I'm going to I'm gonna soften this peak a little bit. I'm gonna enable the vibrations to be kind of uh, at a higher energy. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna induce this vibrational state at a lower energy because there's less atomic planes to reinforce the stiffness of this layer, right? So fewer layers is gonna make this layer less stiff because there's less confinement by additional nuclei and additional layers on the top. On the other hand, this peak stiffens, the energy gets higher. And in this case, the thought is that there's some columbic interactions from these layers up here. Once those are gone, this material becomes more rigid in this direction. So the material becomes less rigid in plane and more rigid, sorry, it becomes less rigid out of plane and more rigid in plane. So, Based on this idea of the response of the material to these vibrations, you can see this shift in the peaks and use that shift, the distance between these two peaks, as an indicator of the thickness of the material. Let's just briefly talk about making devices with these materials. There's some, uh, some important impacts, such as the contacts that are used to integrate this material into a device. And so that's always an important choice. There's some rules of thumb, such as like work functions that can be used. I guess you wanna match the work function of the metal electrode to the semiconductor as best you can to inhibit the barriers. So here's a transistor that's made in this configuration. It's this, uh, in this case, this is a bat gated transistor. And you can see that the contact material, which is shown here, has a huge impact on the operation of this transistor and its performance. So that's an important consideration to make. The material can look a lot different depending on what material you use for the contacts. Let's just talk about a few different applications for thin, flexible devices. And these devices are most readily made using some of the 2D materials techniques that we've talked about. So I think that uh, these kind of ubiquitous electronics or, or electronics for ambient computing are, are something that we're gonna be looking at for the next 10 years.
how to integrate devices unobtrusively into everyday objects. So, you know, the typical electronics manufacturing techniques and materials that we use aren't really going to be uh, applicable to things like food packaging, right? Because food packaging needs to be really cheap. And the, to make single crystal silicon on its own, kind of the first step in the process of making a device a conventional way is a cheap. So these materials present lots of unique applications for inexpensive, flexible electronics. Here's just a few examples that I think are, are pretty interesting. And uh, these are all enhanced. So this is a graphene sensor mounted on a tooth. Uh, and so this can do really interesting things like uh, monitor particular bacteria, the concentration of bacteria in the mouth that result in uh, Alzheimer's and other diseases besides just normal uh, oral disease. You can monitor food. In the United States, something like 30% of the food that's packaged and ready to eat is disposed of because it wasn't uh, eaten or consumed or, or uh, stored properly in time. And there's obviously applications for monitoring human performance in real time. And again, you'd want this to be unobtrusive so it doesn't impede the ability of someone to uh, do their, their job. I work a lot with the Air Force, and so pilots of both you know, high-performance fighter craft and also uh, drones, they have different levels of demands placed on them. And monitoring their fatigue and stress levels in both of these applications is, is pretty useful. So here's a, a simple way. I'll just end with this. So we're all thinking about viruses right now. Here's just a, a way to make very inexpensive virus detectors using these three materials. You can sputter amorphous material on a surface, use a laser to crystallize it, and then you can functionalize the surface of this material with antibodies, right? Antibody is something that's manufactured by the body when the detection of an antigen that's part of a, a virus or some kind of pathogen is detected in the body and antibodies are this natural response to the antigen and they fit perfectly whatever this antibody is for whether it's for the flu or for SARS-CoV-2 which causes COVID-19 that molecule is going to fit perfectly on the surface and it's easy to attach antibodies on a surface of MLS2. And here's just some examples of some uh, virus detection. But it's actually got the same sensitivity as PCR, which is kind of this gold standard test, right? That uh, has the, the highest uh, detection units. And what's nice about these electronic sensors is that the response is instantaneous. You don't have to wait a day or three days to get the response, and you get this PCR type uh, sensitivity. So I'll end here and just say thank you for listening to our discussion of uh, two-dimensional materials. I think that uh, the, the materials you know, using thickness as a knob to control properties in materials is, is very interesting. There's still a lot to be discovered. I think that uh, 2D materials are interesting because you can make them from inexpensive sources. We saw methane as a source. MOS2 is this naturally abundant uh, mineral. And so these materials are, are easy to come by and easy to work with. And uh, I think that a real future, and especially for people in the SDC community, is applying what we know about surface science and growth and kinetics to coming up with novel ways to produce large area, scalable approaches to, uh, to be material manufacturing. So that's it. That's all I've got for now. Thank you for coming to join me today. I'd be happy to talk to you about any questions you might have. Uh, Chris, thank you very, very much. Uh, folks, um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A chat box, but for those participating in the session, I've uh, opened up your microphones. So if anyone has uh, a question, uh, just enable your microphone and ask away. Well, I don't see anyone enabling their microphone, so let me again thank you all for joining us on uh, our webinar 2.0 series. And Chris, thank you so very much for taking time out of your day to share a little bit uh, of extremely important know-how. And as I mentioned to everyone earlier, oh, hold on, I see a question in the chat. Oh, somebody's complimenting Chris uh, for an excellent talk. I, I think we should... Uh,
all agree. Uh, excuse me, I I have a query. Sure, uh, Professor Chris. Yes, yeah. hi there. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, like, still, uh, like, making these devices uh, on a large scale, and uh, uh, like having a uh, like uh, wafer scale film out of these two D materials is, and making devices from these is still not uh, like uh, it's still in the research and. Uh, uh do you think they uh, since you showed some of the devices which uh, are already in the market as well but uh, uh, do you think they will re they are uh, they will really replace uh, what already uh, devices we are using in near future so i think it really depends on the application right so I don't think that 2D materials are the answer for replacing silicon. Uh -huh. um, I don't think that they are the answer for replacing, you know, materials like gallium nitride or gallium oxide for high-powered electronics. But I do think I do think 2 material 2D materials are the answer for low-power, low-cost electronics that will be a huge part of the market in the future. Again, for you know, little devices everywhere little devices that we integrate into our clothing, into our, our plants, and into our food. I think that's where 2D materials can really make an impact. So low power, uh, they're basically inexpensive, low performance electronics that uh, are, are made inexpensively. And I think there's a lot of large area techniques that are coming uh, in the near future that, uh, that will enable this type of, of growth and technology. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chris. It was an excellent talk. Uh, and really, you covered very nicely the growth and the basics and the characterization as well. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you for joining us today. Nice to talk with you. Yeah. Uh, Cole Winder, we have a question from you. Do you want to enable your microphone? Chris, could you check your uh, chat box? The question that has been raised is if you can comment on the scalability of 2D materials for optoelectronics uh, applications. Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, I think that the existing technology for synthesis is not very scalable, and uh, it's funny because I'll work with with partners who will use traditional techniques to make devices. And uh, the yield is is very low. Sometimes, uh, typically, it's about ten percent. For, uh, you know, they'll make many, many transistors on a device and, uh, you know, one out of 10 will work. But I think that there are a number of new approaches to scalable 2D manufacturing. Uh, some of those include printing. Some of those include the laser annealing that we saw before. I think that these are very scalable approaches and some modifications of old approaches that will be coming in the future. So I think, uh, I think it's now, no, but soon, yeah. So as the demand for these kind of ubiquitous devices for ambient computing goes up, the drive to make 2D materials usable will, will also go up. Thank you. Any other questions, folks? Yeah, I have one more query. Uh, in case of uh, gas sensing devices based on 2D materials, I have seen like people... Uh, though they get good response uh, uh, with the gas but uh, the recovery of these materials is pretty poor can you comment on uh, this why could be this that's interesting because um you know so so we've seen so we've done a lot of work in in gas sensing and uh we see really rapid recovery uh, it takes it takes vacuum right so you can either heat or you can vacuum. If you, if you just try to, yeah, the, so the binding is strong, right? That's, that's the trouble. And so if okay. you just, uh, if you're trying to sense one gas in like a uh, air environment and okay. then you just blow air over the surface, it does take a long time. It can take uh, tens of minutes 
to get recovery. So this is just about the binding constant, right? There's very reactive, uh, you get strong interactions between the gas molecules and the sensor surface. There's some things that you can do to facilitate recovery. Yeah, so, people use UV light and all, but I don't understand uh, like how that facilitates that. Can, can you comment uh, that as well? Uh, so I have not, see, I've seen, I have not seen UV light. I wonder if you just get dissociation of the absorbed molecule. I guess it depends on what's absorbed on the surface. But I'm guessing if you dissociate the molecule with UV light, that would be a way to promote desorption. Oh, from the survey. Right. right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Professor. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, folks. So check your mailbox uh, a little later on for a uh, posting uh, of this video up to uh, our YouTube channel. And again, let me thank you all for taking the time from your days to participate in. Uh, a very important service for the SVC. So thank you all. Be safe and be well. Thanks, Frank. Thanks to all of you as well.